Take your Bibles tonight, if you would, please, to Esther chapter 4, please, the book of Esther and chapter 4. Esther's in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Nehemiah. If you get to the book of Job, go back to your left. It's right between there. If you, Psalms, before Psalms is Job, before Job is Esther. Esther chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13 through 17. Verses 13 through 17, and we'll read them responsively, begin together on 13, and I'll read 14, we'll alternate till we end together on verse 17 of Esther chapter 4, and as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 13 of Esther chapter 4, ready? Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, Gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way, and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Father, I pray that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word tonight. Lord, thank you already for the good service and uh, for the good word from Brother Bowman, what you're doing there with the Orphan Frontier Ministry and the uh, Boys Home here in Ohio. Lord, I'm thankful for the wonderful music tonight and the wonderful congregational singing. Now, Lord, bless the special minister to our hearts and prepare us to receive your word in jesus name amen when i examine that old rugged cross the mighty gulf did span it reaches down to the brinks of hell to heaven's golden strand i stand amazed i stand amazed of the love that has sought me Saved me and bought me, I stand amazed. When I imagine in glory that day, when all of him stood still, as God incarnate, the Savior of man died upon Calvary's hill. I stand amazed. I stand amazed of the love that has sought me, saved me, Now, Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. I want to thank you tonight again, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, God, for allowing us to have copies of it tonight in our hands. And I pray that each of us would give the word of God a, a careful attention tonight. From the youngest one in the room to the oldest one in the room, 
I pray, Lord, you'd speak to each one of our hearts and help us to glean uh, the truth that you'd have for us from this story in the book of Esther. So, Lord, guide us and lead us now. Be the master teacher. May your will be accomplished in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want you to Bibles to be open to the book of Esther. I'm going to walk you through the story just a little bit and then give us some applications. I realize some of you tonight are very familiar uh, with the story of Esther, but there might be some here tonight who are not familiar with the story of Esther. I don't ever want to uh, assume that you know uh, what the story is all about. Uh, I remember uh, I hadn't been preaching very long, and I was in a part of an illustration one time, used the story of Abraham and his sacrifice of Isaac, and how God had told him to go up to Mount Moriah, and that uh, Isaac went and had the wood, and they had the fire, and he laid Isaac on the altar, and I was talking about how God, Abraham, raised that knife up, ready to take the life of his son, and then I went on to something else. And I'll never forget, a lady came up to me right after service. She said, well, what happened? I said, what are you talking about? She goes, well, you had that guy raise his knife up to kill his son. Did he kill him? Uh, she had no idea. She'd never heard the story before. And I left her hanging there. You know, she didn't get anything out of the rest of the message. She was just thinking about whether that guy killed his son or not. So I, I want to make sure that you understand uh, what's going on here in the book of Esther, it starts out with a king named Ahasuerus. Uh, he's also known as King Xerxes, and most people would rather call him Xerxes because it's easier to say than Ahasuerus, all right? And um, he's throwing a, a six-month-long party. Uh, that's a party, my friend. That's uh, six months, 180 days, and uh, it's a big drunken party. And he finally, at the, near the end of this time, he calls for the queen, who's Vashti, and he calls for her, if you notice, in um, uh, verse number, let's see, verse number 11, he says I, he wanted to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. All right? Now, he, he commands her to come to dance before the party, and she refuses to do so. You didn't refuse the king. Uh, it doesn't matter if you were the queen or not. Uh, you didn't say no to the king. So she was ousted as being the queen. He could have had her put to death, but he just exiled her. And uh, what happened next was kind of like a... Uh, uh, a beauty pageant uh, to try to find another queen. And of one of the girls that was brought in was this one named Esther. Uh, the, she was a Jew. They were in exile here in Persia. And she was one of the ones that was chosen. And uh, it's really interesting. She didn't let anybody know that she was a Jew. So no one was aware of that in the palace. And they, by the way, they had a whole year before uh, they came before the king and he'd make this decision. A uh, whole year, they got nothing but pampered. They got beauty treatments and special diet and they got taken care of and got perfumes and got uh, just all kinds of... Ladies, that'd be a pretty good deal, you know, for a whole year. She, that's all that happened. Now, by the way, before I go on, let me tell you, there's something very interesting about the book of Esther. Uh, it's, the only, it's the only book in the Bible where God is not mentioned. The word G-O-D is not found in the book of Esther. Uh, and yet, God is more at work in the book of Esther than he is in many places. He is, just because you don't see him mentioned doesn't mean he's not there. Uh, he is definitely at work, and you'll see that as this story unfolds. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of subplots as you get into the book of Esther, but basically, the bottom line is, she's chosen to be the next queen, and she takes her place in the palace. Meanwhile, there's another guy uh, who's rising to prominence in the palace. His name is Haman. And Haman uh, is, is gained the favor of the king, and he's rising up through the ranks, but Haman hates the Jews. And there's a particular Jew that he hates, and his name is Mordecai, who we read about earlier in our scripture reading. He hates him. That is Esther's uncle. All right? He is the one who has brought her up. 
and she listens to him, and he's taught her and, and basically reared her uh, from a, being a child. It doesn't say anything what happened to Esther's parents. Uh, it just says Mordecai was taking care of her. And so uh, Haman, uh, through the series of events, and you can read all this, he, he gets the king to sign a decree to have all the Jews exterminated. Kill them. Get rid of all of them. And hoping to get Mordecai killed. You see, Haman, Haman would walk out the streets and everybody would bow down to Haman just like he was the king. Except one guy. One guy wouldn't bow down and that was Mordecai. And it just ate him up. He, he couldn't see all the hundreds that bowed down. He only saw that one guy who wouldn't. And, and, and by the way, that's the way Satan will always work. He'll get you to focus on one. What did he get to do Adam and Eve? Did he get Adam and Eve to see all the trees they could eat? No. Focus on that one you're not allowed to have. If God really loved you, he'd want you to have that. See, he doesn't and he gives all the reasons why he doesn't. Just focus on that one thing you can't have and that's what happened to Haman. And, and so he signs a decree and once word comes to Mordecai and he hears what has been done, he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he begins to pray and he begins to, to seek God and what to do and, and, and he finally gets the, the, the thought that what has to happen here is Esther. She's the inside one and she's going to have to go to the king. Ah, but there's a hitch. Chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, He gave him a copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it to Esther and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And so they sent that by messenger, and they gave that to Esther, and uh, that's leading up uh, to the verses uh, we read. But notice what she said in verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. I said, man, he hasn't called for me in 30 days. He may not call for me for another 30 days. I don't know. But if, if someone goes into the king and he didn't ask them to come in, if he doesn't raise the golden scepter and say it's okay, it was immediate death. And Mordecai is saying, say, you need to go in and talk to him. How would you respond? Hmm? Esther was said, boy, this is, this is really a difficult thing and she is... He tells her in verse 14, and this is our text for tonight, Who knoweth, she said, that you, whether thou art coming to the kingdom for such a time as this. He's saying, if you hold your peace, Esther, deliverance will come from somewhere else. I believe God will take care of his people. I believe God will protect us. But this is, this is your opportunity. And you understand, you won't be exempt just because you're the queen you will be found out and that you're a Jew and that you'll be destroyed as well. And what Esther did, she asked him to fast for her. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. And she said, I and my maidens will fast likewise. And then I'll go into the king, which is not according to the law. And she says, if I perish, I perish. And of course, if you don't know the story, Esther went in to the king and he raised the scepter. And she talked to him, and she was very wise. She knew about Haman's plan, and what she did was, she goes, King, I want you to, to, to have a feast. I want you to have a banquet, and I want you to invite Haman to the banquet. And when she invites Haman to the banquet, she tells Haman she knows about his plot, and that she's gonna, he's going to say something to the king, and she does say something to the king, and the king is furious. And when the king walks out, Haman thinks he better plead for his life. And he pleads for his life with Esther, and he kind of uh, leans on her and leans on the bed she's on, and when the king comes in, he thinks, oh, now what are you trying to do? Take the queen? And he's really furious. And he finds out some things that Mordecai had at one time 
saved his life. The king did. Uh, he's, he, one night he can't sleep, and so he calls some helpers, and they read the congressional record to him. That'll put anybody to sleep. Okay? And they're reading this to him, and, and, and he finds out that there was an assassination plot. And he didn't know about it, but he found out about it, and they thwarted it. Well, he said, who reported that? He said, this guy named Mordecai. He said, what was ever done for him? He said, nothing was ever done for him. Well, he calls Haman in. And he says, Haman, he says, what should be done to the one whom the king delights in? Haman thinks he's talking about him. Well, I'd put the royal stuff on him, and I'd give him the, your horse to ride on, and I'd, I'd have all the people, you know, parade him right down the road, and all the people, uh, you know, cheer and clap for him or bow down to him. And he said, okay, you do all that for Mordecai. Oh, long story short, Haman had made a gallows. A gallows wasn't what you think, that we, we think of. In those days, a gallows basically was just a big, long spear. It was, I think the Bible says, 10 stories tall. It was, it was 100, over 100 feet tall. And all they would do would be, they would impale the guy on that. And then he'd be up there for everybody to see. And he made one of those intending that when the decree went out to kill all the Jews, he personally would put Mordecai up there. Well, when this was exposed and he was uh, found out, then he found out what Mordecai had done to rescue him. Uh, Haman was executed on the very gallows that he had built. And another decree had to be issued. He couldn't change the previous decree. But another decree had to be issued and had to be sent out reversing the decree to kill all the Jews. And that had to get out, and it did. And it's a great story. Uh, it's ten chapters. It's a great, great book. And you ought to take time to read it through. I think you'll really, you'll really enjoy it. But I want to focus tonight, if you will, on verse 14, where it simply says this. He says, Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? What kind of time was it? Number one, I think it was a time where pleasure was the order of the day. If you notice back in chapter 1, when... The king was having his party. Notice with me verse 7. He gave them drink in the vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, and none did compel, for the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's what, church? Everybody's pleasure. Pleasure was the order of the day. They were lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. They lived for pleasure. It was a time when they could have worshipped God and honored God, but they'd rather worship pleasure. It was a time for them to have studied the law of God, and they chose to neglect the law and party. And they chose to not do anything that God wanted to do. And you think, well, that was them. They were heathen. That doesn't happen to us. Does it happen to us? When we'd rather get that extra sleep on Sunday morning than come to Sunday school. When we rather stand in the hallway at church and talk rather than be in church for the service. When we do we do we sing the songs and sing along in the service and sing with melody in our heart to the Lord? Or do we sit quietly when the songs of God are being sung? And look around everybody else. When it's go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do we have a, a, a time during the week where we go to give the gospel to people? Do we take gospel tracts with us and pass them out and take the opportunities God gives us? Or do we talk about the weather and talk about business and try to get folks in, in, in lined up in our business and we never tell anybody about Jesus? Paul wrote in 2 Timothy that the time will come when in the last days and perilous times that men will be lovers of themselves. Proud, boasters, heady, mixed old list. And he ends up by saying they're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. I think about that when we see churches that do away with Sunday night service. Church that do away with midweek service. Why? We want to just do what we want to do on Sunday. 
lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Is it a time that we love pleasure more than we love God? Is it a, or is it a time that we love God more than we love pleasure? Do we really seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Is it a time that we put pleasure before anything else? We know from chapter 1, secondly, it was also a time for strong drink. If this, this basically was a six-month drunk, a six-month party where they were drinking. Alcohol is such a horrible influence. And alcohol <clears throat> is such a blight on America. Causes husbands to beat on their wives. Causes wives to poor mouth their husbands. It causes men and women to disrespect their bodies. The Bible or the, the statistics show there's 100 million people that drink alcohol in the United States alone. One out of every eight adults drink al drinks alcohol. Four out of every ten women are alcoholics. Six out of ten men are alcoholics. Alcohol will affect one family in every four. The recent statistics that I saw said 31% of high school students drink alcohol. Fifteen of them admit that they're heavy drinkers. The number one cause of death for young people 15 to 24 years of age is related to alcohol. But it's not just the young people. 67% of the people in prison are there on alcohol-related crime. 25% of all the people who plead insanity in court because alcohol. 37% of people who live in poverty because alcohol. 65% of child abuse cases involve alcohol. 30% of all suicides. 50% of all motor vehicle accidents. 80% of all assaults. 85% of all murders. Alcohol related. Tell me again why you think it's okay to drink. Tell me again why you think it's okay to have uh, alcohol. That there's nothing wrong with being a social drinker. Now, they're not one of those people on that list, not any of them that are in jail for a crime, but they started out taking one drink. They started out saying, well, just one won't hurt. Oh, don't listen to those narrow-minded people who say you can't have alcohol. Well, look where it's got you. Solomon was right when he said, wine's a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And if you're not wise, you're foolish. Don't do it. When they're drunk is when he decides to call the queen in to show her beauty. And that could be two things in their culture. It could have been that she had come in with, without a veil, which would be a great insult to her, or she would come in with a veil and nothing else. Just a crown. But it was a time when through alcohol, men wanted women to disgrace their bodies. And the queen wouldn't do it. Vashti, though we don't know anything about her, we know anything about her background, and she wasn't a Jew, she wasn't someone who brought up in the, with the God of Israel, but she knew enough to have decent. By the way, whether you're saved or lost, there ought to be some standards of decency and standards of dignity. Our country used to have those. We've lost that. She didn't give up, give up her integrity. I like Vashti. She chose to keep her clothes on. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 that, that in like manner that holy women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety as women professing godliness with good works. So be careful, ladies. You, you don't dress to show off your body. Be careful you don't fall into the, the ways of the world. You get, 
you, when, when, you know, you, you're, you're not there to draw attention. The Bible, when the Bible talks about not gold and, uh, you know, your, your braiding hair and all that, it's a drawing attention to the outside. You're to draw attention to the inside. You're to draw attention to the countenance. A woman that professes godliness with good works. When you put something on or you're ready to go out in public, you ought to ask yourself, will people looking at me say, that must be a godly young lady? Or that, that obviously must be a Christian because of the way she looks. I'll confess to you, there's many times we've been in a store or a shopping mall and we see some young ladies walking down the mall and they're dressed modestly or maybe a skirt or a dress and my wife and I will mark to each other. I wonder if they're... Christians. Well, how do you make that decision? Because man looks on the outward appearance. If you tried to give somebody a gospel track or give somebody a witness the way you were dressed, ladies, would they be surprised to find out that you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ? You see, have some. Uh, make sure that you're following what God wants in such a time as this. It was a time when men loved pleasure. It's a time when they loved strong drink. It was a time when the value of life was cheapened. Haman, in chapter 3, we find out, remember, we, he made the decree, or he got the king to decree that he wanted to destroy all the Jews throughout the kingdom. That's not valuing human life, is it? What about us? What about our society? Abortions. You know what that is? Not valuing human life. Life. Uh, what, what determines life is God. The fruit of the womb. He read it tonight. The, the children are heirs of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Euthanasia. Killing off the old people. Well, you, you need this or you need that. But you know what? You are 85 and you've lived a long life. Drive-by shootings. Now, now people driving cars into crowds. Killing people. We don't value life. All of that comes when we don't value life. God is about life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and you ha might have it more abundantly. Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's God. Fear him. It's a time where they cheapened human life. A time where they loved pleasure more than they loved God. A time where they were given to strong drink, alcohol. It's a time of great wickedness throughout their nation. Fornication, partying, cursing, foul language, men and women burning in their lust for one another, where nobody had any standard of righteousness, nobody had any standard that said, this is right, this is the way, walk ye in it. And I understand, uh, the Persians were not, a, were not a godly country. They didn't have churches. But listen, my friend, what is America's excuse? And listen, the fault does not lie. I don't, I don't lay the fault at the political system, and I'm not laying the fault at the social system. I'm not laying the fault in America at the, at the feet of the unsaved American. We lay the fault where it ought to be, and that's the feet of the churches. We're the conscience of a country. And when, when the churches stop preaching righteousness and stop preaching holiness, and stop preaching a standard of God to the people of God, and we started living just like everybody around us, and we have no influence in the world at all. If the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Well, it was a time for somebody to stand up for God and God's people. And that somebody was going to be Esther. She would stand up. 
in the midst of the pleasure and the strong drink and the unethical uh, uh, dressing and the unvalued life and the wickedness and the sexual impurities and the spiritual indifference and the covetousness, God had somebody there to stand up for him. Somebody said, well, pastor, it's hard. Well, do you think it was hard in her day? Well, things are bad. Don't you think it was bad in her day? You think how difficult it was for her? Mordecai understood that God would deliver his people. He knew the history of the Jews. He knew the promise that God made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He knew God would keep his people. But he said, listen, I know God's going to be faithful. And I know God's at work. And I know that God's going to bring deliverance. But Esther, you may have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. This may be exactly why whatever happened to your parents happened to your parents, why I brought you up, why God put us in the captivity here, why God had Vashti do what she did so you could get the position you've got into because God knew this was coming and He knew that you would be in the right position. It may be you came into the kingdom for such a time as this. Now understand Esther. She's living pretty comfortably. She's in the king's palace. She is the queen. She's being pampered. She had luxury. She had anything she could dream or desire. She asked for anything. She would, it would be hers. She had kept her nationality a secret. And so no one knew that she was a Jew. She could have just sat in silence and she could have hoped that no one would tell who she really was. And maybe she'd escape. Now Mordecai, I said, don't you think that for a minute. But maybe that was going through her mind. I don't know. But she did understand through Mordecai the unique role that she would play in delivering the Jews from the decree of annihilation. He, God put her in a place to serve him and to do something for him that nobody else could do. She was there for such a time as this. This was her opportunity. And it, and it didn't and it involved she'd have to get out of her comfort zone. She'd have to do something that she wouldn't be comfortable doing. And she knew that. And she understood that. She would have to forsake the comfort of her own lifestyle. And what she wanted and what she felt like uh, she was comfortable doing would have to take a back seat to trying to help save a nation. She had to make that choice. Now we don't live in royalty like Esther, but we do live in comfort. And we do live in security. Our needs are met. Most of us have a place to live and food to eat and family and friends to care for us and to love us. And it's easy... It's easy for us sometimes as American Christians to, to live our lives go day by day and do our jobs and eat our food and live in our houses and sleep in our beds and turn a blind eye to people that need Jesus Christ. Turn a blind eye to people that need the salvation that we have. And we say, we're good. I'm saved. That's all that matters. Is it all that matters? And just let everyone else perish without the gospel we're the ones who's supposed to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature we're the ones who've been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ they can't call on him in whom they've not believed and they can't believe in him whom they've never heard and how can they hear without a preacher that preacher is us We've been entrusted with the gospel. We're to go tell others what Jesus Christ has done for us and what Jesus Christ has done for them. How can we, how can we be silent about that? How can we not, how can we be in our comfort and say, all right, the decree's been signed. And by the way, the decree has been signed. If they do not believe in Christ, they will perish and die and go to hell. How can we let that happen when we are here for such a time as this.
Esther decides she's got to do it. And I like what she said. Did you catch it in verse number 16? She asked them to fast for her. You fast, I'll fast. We'll pray and ask God to, to intervene. And she makes a, a great statement here. I'm going to go into the king in the latter part of verse 16, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. It's, 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 she says, I'm going to do what I know I ought to do, even if it costs me my life. She followed through on what she knew God wanted her to do. Now let me apply it and we'll be done. Listen. Next week we'll mark 62 years of Bible Baptist Church. We, hey, we, we enjoy a building. We enjoy buildings. The Fellowship Hall, this building, the building downstairs. We enjoy buildings because, and, and most, I don't know, I don't think anybody was in this. Nobody in this room was here, I don't think, when this building was built. 1970. 47 years ago. Anybody in this church then? I didn't think so. But I'm sure glad that those who are here were here for such a time as this. And they built a building. They built a building that we're enjoying now. But you see, we weren't here then, but guess what? We're here now. This is our such a time as this. This is our such a time as this. This is our opportunity now. And you say, well, I'm here, but what about all this missionary stuff? Well, this is your such a time as this. It's no accident you're here when, when we're supporting missionaries and expanding the reach of Bible Baptist Church around the world. To, to, to reach our arms around the world to people who've never heard of Christ. Such a time as this. It's no accident you're here when, 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 when Brother Bowman shows up. You know, uh, how'd that all work out in the timing that God was doing stuff for him 3,000 miles away in San Diego, California? And working things in that way to move him back here to Ohio at the same time that you're in this church and that I'm in this church. How did that happen? See, that's God. There's such a time as this with the RU ministry and the opiate crisis. Not only in our country, but in our state. Ohio leads the nation. Ohio leads the nation. And listen to me. It is not, I listened to a program today for just a little bit while I was getting ready and they were talking about this thing and they're, they're, they're convinced that this whole addiction thing is a brain disease. And I think, well, wait a minute. Fifteen years ago they didn't have that brain disease. You mean something's happened in the last 15 years that has given people brain disease? No, no, no. The problem isn't here. The problem's here. It's a matter of the heart. And you've got to get to the heart of the matter. You have to change people's hearts. And, and, and there's no accident that God has, has allowed us to begin this RU program and move into the fifth, sixth year, and we're going to hit our stride here pretty soon. There's a great crowd here Friday night. Four new people here Friday night. There's new ones that, that God's going to bring our way. We have to be ready to, to, to minister. Why? It's such a time as this. It's such a time as this. Such a time as this. And that's why we keep the RU program and the RU Inside program. I wish I could read a note to you that came. Did I read that? I don't know if I did. Did I read that? I read that Friday night, didn't I? No, from the, uh, the Mortier, Gabriel Mortier. Who sent the thing? Do you have it on your phone? Do you have your phone with you? That was uh, you. You you uh, you message it to, not on instant messenger. You did it on a what do they call that? Text. You texted it to me. That's an inside. Yeah, you can tell I'm technologically savvy, can't you? <laughs> Just rolls out of me. I know I can't help it. Um, and God's doing. I was doing some, some wonderful things. Listen, such a time as this. Why are you here for such a time as this? 
Why here at this time in the church for such a time as this? We've seen that. Some of you have been here for, for 10 years, and you know what you've seen? We've seen some people come in, and then sometimes they go. But you know what? God had them come for such a time as this. Just the right time. And now he's moved them somewhere else, not because something's wrong with them, not because something's wrong with us, because God had them go somewhere else for such a time as that and to help someone else. God, God places the members in his body as it pleases him. And God will move people at times as it pleases him. Sometimes that doesn't please me. But God doesn't check with me. I have to learn to submit to him. Okay? And, you know, I don't, I don't like it sometimes. I don't like it that it pleases him to pick the tailors up and deposit them in Georgia. I argue with God about that. But he wins the argument, okay? But it's such a time as this. And, and we, have to, we have to understand. But God, God takes the, the Moreland family and then he moves the Moreland family back here. Why? Such a time as this. God, God knows who to place where he needs to place them, and when he needs to place them. Did you find that? Did you? Bring it up here so I can read it. Okay? Got it? Thank you. Yeah, this is from uh, a prisoner, and he, he emailed this to us. They have JPay email through the uh, prison system. He uh, sent this to myself and to Brother Bob. He said, praise and glory be to God. He has healed me. I saw the psych doctor, and she proclaimed that she is annoyingly proud of my success. I explained that with the joy and happiness I have found in Christ, that I no longer need the antidepressants or the anti-anxiety medication. She took notice of the religious programs and school courses that I'm involved with, and decided that I was healed of the psychological conditions that ailed me. I give all praise and glory unto the Father through Christ in the Spirit. Nonetheless, continue to pray for me as I pray for my Christian brothers and sisters, Brother Gabriel. That's, that's worth it all right there. Buddy. That's the RU program on the RU inside. See, that's, that's somebody, hey, what do you... When you have Jesus Christ, I told the group Friday night, when it says that he's the wonderful, uh, the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. The word peace there is the same word that we get our word tranquilizer. Jesus is our tranquilizer. So when the angel was born, the angel said, on earth, peace. Not peace on earth. On earth, peace. Jesus. Goodwill towards men. He's the Prince of Peace. If he resides in my heart, what do I got to take a pill for? What do I got to take a chill pill for? What do I have to take a tranquilizer for? Where's Jesus? Where's the Prince of Peace? Shouldn't he be resident in my life? But we listen to the psychiatrist before we listen to God's word. Hmm? Hmm? Say, so what's that got to do with such a time as this? Nothing. I just thought I ought to put that in there. Somebody needed that tonight. You know what, church? It's, it's such a time as this. For us to impact our community, for us to impact our state, for us to impact our country, for us to impact our world. We have, we have opportunities before us that have never been before another generation. You understand, there's, how many of you ever looked at a video online, a video on Facebook or YouTube, and you've seen, you know, hundreds of thousands or so many millions of people have viewed this thing? You ever done that? When was that ever possible before? I believe you could, you could take a service and put on YouTube and you promote that thing and there could be millions of people watch that. You can give the gospel to millions of people. 30 years ago, you'd have said that's impossible. Never could have happened. But now it's possible. What opportunities? What a such a time as this 
that we get to live in. We get to be a part of this. What a great opportunity. Brother, Brother Bowman, he can, he can announce a website that somebody from the other side of the world could go on and donate money to him. As long as it's pesos. <laughs> or dollar bills, huh? It's really incredible what God can do for such a time as this. Don't miss that. Who knows? Who knows that you didn't come to Bible Baptist Church for such a time as this? That's why you're here. Let's ask God to, let's respond the way Esther did. And let's say, let's do what God called us to do. We're going to pray. Let's fast and pray. Let's ask God to help us. Let's ask God to use us. But let's do our best to rescue a world that's lost and dying, perishing. Because this is our time to do it. Hey, I'm thankful that those before us did it when they were here. But now it's our turn. This is our time. Let's do it. For who knows? We weren't born for such a time as this. Somebody said earlier, well, we're the last days. Jesus is coming. Wouldn't that be great to be part of the generation that sees Jesus come back? I was telling, you know, Friday... Uh, my wife and I celebrated 38 years of marriage. I married her when she was six. <laughs> but, you know, I, honestly, I remember getting married in 1979 thinking, I better get married because Jesus is coming back. Seriously. I, I didn't think I, I, didn't, I won't get married, Brother Taylor, because I didn't know, you know, the Lord will come back and I'll miss out on that. If you'd have told me, You'll celebrate 38 years in 2017. I'd have said we won't be around in 2017. I'd have told you we wouldn't have been here. I, you wouldn't have convinced me otherwise. I'm surprised we're here. Not that I'm married in 2017, but that we're still here. That Jesus hasn't come back. I didn't think we'd see this this far into it. I'll be, I'll be surprised if, if, if I see 50 years of marriage, 12 more years. If we're still here in 2029, I'll be surprised. I'll be shocked. I really think Jesus will come back, but I know this. I'm here for such a time as this. There have been some, there have been some wonderful pastors Bible Baptist Church has had through the years. Thank God for them. Thank God for what they did. They were faithful for such a time as this. But now it's our turn. It's our turn to be faithful for such a time as this. And if the Lord tarries 12 more years, if he tarries 20 more years, many of us won't be here. But somebody will be. And I want them to look and say, boy, I'm thankful they were faithful for such a time as this. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you Lord, for everyone's attention. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be faithful as Esther was, to say, you know what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do what I ought to do. If I perish, I perish. But I'm going to not miss my opportunity to do something for God. This is our opportunity to impact our world for Christ, to reach out to others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our such a time as this. Lord, don't let us miss it. If we don't do it, you'll, you'll provide deliverance through somebody else. We'll miss out. We'll miss out. And I don't want to miss out. Father, I pray that you'd burden our heart. Help us as a church. Help us as individuals to say, I'm here for such a time as this. God, use me. Use me. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. We don't live in any different day than what Esther lived in. We don't have any worse of a situation than what she did. But she did what she could. God put her in a strategic position. And God has put us in a strategic position. For such a time as this. What's your part? What does God want you to do? 
What part would God have you to play? What, 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 what ministry, what mission would God have you to be a part of? Maybe, by the way, it's everybody's mission to give the gospel. Maybe God has spoken to your heart about that. Maybe you've fallen into loving pleasure more than loving God. So easy to fall into and conform to the ways of the world and not seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. But I wonder tonight how many folks in the room would just say, Preacher, I realize that I'm here. This is my time. This is our such a time as this. And I want God to use my life. Whatever He gives me, this is my time. He's placed me on this earth for such a time as this. And I want my life to count for God. Pastor, God has dealt with my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me. Wonderful. Amen. That's good. Hands all over the building. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. Why don't you, God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you speak to him tonight? The altar is going to be open. You respond to him this evening. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that each one would do what you're bidding them to do in their heart. May your will be done in our lives tonight as we bow the knee. May we thank you that we're born and we're living right now in such a time as this. It's a great time to serve God. It's a great time to tell others of Christ. It's a great time to get the gospel out. It's a great time to serve you. Lord, I pray that you would use us for such a time as this. Bless this invitation now, and I'll thank you for it. Quietly with your heads bowed, stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him tonight. All to Jesus That's right. I surrender. All to him I freely give. That's right. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I surrender humbly at his feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me, Jesus, take me now I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I surrender Make me Savior holy Thine Let me feel the Holy Spirit Truly know that Thou art mine I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Look this way for a minute, if you would. Glad to have Tiffany Sargent coming tonight, and Tiffany is coming, uh, rededicating her life to Christ. Amen. 
uh, Tiffany came several years ago, and uh, she gave a testimony Friday night just briefly at the RU, and uh, she came to RU several years ago when she was here, and she said, you know, I came, and um, paraphrasing a little bit her testimony, but went through the motions, but her heart wasn't in it, and didn't mean business about it. And uh, she said, I mean business this time. And uh, really putting her heart into it. And, and uh, I think she talked to Mrs. Taylor this afternoon. And uh, she's ready to live for God. And uh, isn't that great? Yeah. Tiffany, we're so glad that you're back and uh, you're, we're, you're here. And uh, we're going to help you all we can live for God. And uh, so glad to have you and Sissy back with us. And uh, we'll trust that you can bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. Be a good example to her. That's great. Congratulations. Amen. That's good. All right. Well, don't forget the missionary cards on the back table. Look and see what the Lord would have you do. And uh, let's be a blessing to them. You always are. And uh, let's do so again this year. Be a special blessing to each of these families. Uh, make note of the, the names. They're on the prayer guide too Wednesday night. Uh, begin praying for them. Uh, every day from now to the conference. Uh, look at their pictures. Recognize them. When they get here, you'll be able to call them by name. You know why? Because you prayed for them every day. And uh, you'll even know the children's names by the time they get here. And uh, get, those, get those down, and uh, it'll be a great blessing to them. It's a great blessing for a missionary to show up, and especially if it's somebody we support. It's a great blessing for them to walk in and not people say, who are you? Uh, it's a great blessing when they're called by name. And uh, let's, let's be that kind of a church, okay? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for a good Lord's Day together. Thank you for decisions that have been made for you throughout the day today, the souls that have been saved. Thank you for Tiffany for dedicating her life to thee tonight. Lord, I pray you'll help her to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to be an encouragement and a help to her. And Lord, help her to be faithful to all the services at Bible Baptist Church. Now, Lord, dismiss us with your care. Lord, make us mindful you go with us from this place. Be with the dear folks who will be traveling on down to uh, Lexington. And I pray you'll give them safety as they travel down to the college. Uh, give the girls a good year there. Bless the work there at Clays Mill Road Baptist Church. Father, give us now a good week. May others see Christ in us throughout this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Here we go. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere I go. For it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.